Hey guys, welcome to Catch Fire Podcast. My name's Pastor Al, and I'm so excited that you tuned in today. You know, um, this has been a new project, and we are so excited about some of the things that we've been doing here on Catch Fire. Uh, I really want to say how grateful I am for those of you that tune in, uh, you subscribe to the podcast, but also those of you that leave comments and even ask questions. You know, we're really looking to the future. And we want to be able to provide insights and information and transformation to those of you that are really interested in igniting your leadership, igniting your influence, and really enlarging your lives. It's really important to us. I mean, that's the whole purpose of this podcast. So we we ask you to subscribe, be a part of our community. We're going to be doing some really cool things with our subscribers. But then also leave a comment or a question or a topic that you would like us to discuss. We're going to read those comments. We're going to continue to take your feedback. We want you to feel part of the podcast. And and that's what social media is all about, man, connecting with people. This is about people. This is not about, you know, just getting on here and talking on a camera and just sharing notes and information. This is about connecting with people. So we want to connect with you. We really do. And so also, uh, so be sure to subscribe and also leave a comment or question and we're going to be going through those and we got some really cool things coming up. You know, uh, we have some great stuff that we've already uh, recorded, but there's going to be some great things coming up. So I'm really looking forward to the future of Catch Fire podcast. Now, today, uh, I'm just, you know, want to take this time to share a little bit about some things that are on my heart. You know, um, it really is a new day. I mean, we're we're in a new time. We're in a new season coming out of this pandemic You know, it it almost feels like our lives have been, uh, in some ways, topsy-turvy, turned upside down. Uh, There's definitely a refashioning in our lives. There's, uh, for some of us, there's a new cast of characters. I I know me and my wife have been talking lately how, you know, there's just like a whole new cast of characters in our life. And uh, whenever there's new relationships and new things happening, you know, there's always those personal adjustments that you have to make in your leadership you know, and, and coming out of this pandemic, I think everybody's really uh, striving to bounce back, to bounce back stronger, to come back better, but to really, uh, in a sense, reorganize their lives, get back on track is what a lot of people are talking about. I mean, a lot of the friends that I have, pastor friends that I have, business leaders that I know and I'm connected with are talking about getting back on track and reorganizing their lives and reorganizing their leadership And uh, it it really is a a unique time. I I really feel like in my heart, like whatever we've done in the past has been great, but we can even uh, do better. We we have an opportunity to do things in a way where whether it's your family, whether it's your church, whether it's your business, whatever you're leading, that this is an opportunity to really go to another level. And we know that a lot of that has to do not just with our leadership, but it has to do with our teams. You know, many of us are reconstructing teams. You know, there, there are people that might, might have been with us for a season that aren't there anymore. And now there's new people on the scene with new gifts, new talents, new ideas. But the question becomes is, is what kind of leader are we? How are we leading these people? How are we leading our organization to victory? And I, I really feel this. That if, you're, if you're tuning in to Catch Fire today and you feel like you've had a setback, well, let me know. Let me tell you that God is setting you up for a major comeback I know that sounds very cliche, but it's a setup. It's not a setback. It's a setup. And so I'm excited to see what's going to flow out of you in the days to come. Now, what's on my heart today is I want to talk about teams. I want to talk about team leadership. Um, I've been doing team ministry, uh, I could say, pretty much all my life. Um, From a very young age, I've been involved in sports. I started playing football and baseball at the age of, I think, eight years old. Uh, played all through my childhood, all through high school. Uh, I've been a part of a team pretty much my whole life. I think there was just a couple of years there where I wasn't a part of a team when I wasn't serving the Lord. And when I gave my life to Jesus, once again, right back on teams, working in youth ministry, building student ministry, uh, working in the church. I, I mean, I almost feel like I'm built for a team because my whole life I've been a part of a team. And there's a few things that I've learned about team, team ministry and team leadership, you know, a leader is only as good as his team. See, we've heard that before. A leader is only as good as his team, but, but might might I present to you say that a team is also only as good as its leader. See, as leaders, we have to have a team mindset, a team mentality. 
It's not about me. It's about we. Now, a great example of that is football. I love to watch football. And we know Tom Brady is one of the greatest quarterbacks that ever lived. And whatever team you follow, whether it's the Packers or Aaron Rodgers or the Raiders and Derek Carr, if, if you watch football, you know that there's a quarterback. But the quarterback is only as good as his team. It's only, he's only as good as his linemen, his wide receivers, and his running backs. And even the game plan plays an important role in what the quarterback does. And a lot of times after a game, you'll, you'll, you, you'll see a quarterback get before the cameras at the press conference, whether they won or lost, and he'll talk about the game. And the interviewers or the, the media will ask him, you know, what, what, what went right and what went wrong. But this is the part I want you to see about a quarterback. When a team wins, the quarterback always gets more credit than he deserves. And it really is the truth. When a team wins, the, the captain of the team, he's going to get more credit. You can call it glory, whatever you want to call it. He's going to get credit. He's going to get more credit than he deserves. But here's another truth. When the team loses, the quarterback takes more blame than he deserves. Because to be successful at anything, we have to function well as a team. But today, I feel that we need to start with the leader of the team. Talk about the leader of the team. Now, Another term for leader that I like to use when it comes to teams is I like to use the term captain, the captain of the team. You have a captain of a ship, a captain of an organization. Even as a pastor, you know, we are leaders, but we are also captains. We're involved in steering the organization to victory. So I want to bring out a couple of things about being an effective captain, being an effective leader of a team. Now, understand that as a captain or a team leader, you have two roles. The first thing I think is so important is that as a captain, we have to know our gifts. We have to know our talents and we have to know what we're good at. We have to know what we're good at. We have to know what we're bad at. Let's look at Tom Brady as a quarterback. He's a tremendous passer. He knows how to time his passes. He, he, he knows how to stay in the pocket. What he's horrible at is running. <laughs> you get him outside of his pocket, and he's going to get tackled. He's probably one of the slowest players on the field. So that's not one of his strengths. And as a team captain, we have to know our strengths and we have to know our weaknesses. So once we discover our strengths, here, here's the key. We want to excel in our gift. We want to excel in our strength. When, when, when a captain can know his strengths and excel in his strengths, he can be a greater asset to the overall team. Because what happens is as you discover your gifts and your talents and you know what you're great at, then you become a model of excellence for your team. Where your team says, hey, my leader is excellent at this. They give their all to this. My pastor is excellent at this. They give their all to this. They really know how to excel. And it causes us to know our role and to shine in our role. And, and then also it demonstrates really uh, effectiveness to the people that are following us. Now, I, I think it's so important that as leaders, as captains of teams, we, we have to move in a motivated spirit. We, we've got to be motivated. That's so important because the the tone, the pace, the the uh, the patterns that we set are going to be the what the team follows. And and you know we all know what it is to be around an unmotivated leader, somebody that doesn't provide the energy, doesn't provide the tone, doesn't give enough. Give, give the right pace. You know, for me as a pastor and as a leader, I'm a, I'm a quick guy. You know, some guys are like four by fours. Some, of, some guys are like tanks. I'm a little bit more like a Ferrari. I, I like to go fast. I like to turn quickly. I, I like change. To me, I'm a very change ready leader. If there's a change that needs to take place, I'm on it. I'm an early adopter. I'm not late on the curve. I, I want to be the first to experience the breakthrough. And so as a leader, I'm very quick. And I think a lot of times th that's a great asset to a team. W when the leader can be highly motivated, uh, highly empowered, work with a lot of energy, it, it really brings in a spirit of encouragement and empowerment to the team. It sets the right tone. It sets the right example. And um, I I've talked to so many pastors that want to grow their churches or or people that are trying to grow what they're building. And the first thing I'll ask them, what's your pace? You know, when you think about pace, you think about work ethic. You think about getting up early in the morning and, 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 and really pursuing that purpose. I always tell people, you know, the alarm clock doesn't wake me up. My purpose wakes me up. 
you know, every morning when I get up to pray and seek the Lord and spend time with God, I want to really seek the Lord because God has given me a purpose. And I try to get up earlier than everybody else. Uh, a lot of times I go to bed later than everybody else. I mean, give me five or six hours of sleep and, I, and I'm just fine because I want to set a pace for my organization. So to be an effective captain, to be an effective leader, you've got to be a pace setter. You've, you've got to really have the right energy, the right motivation. Uh, it's so important to leading your team. Now, there are five keys to being an effective captain that I want to, I want to bring out to you that I really feel are going to help you, especially if you're, if you're rebuilding, especially if you're on the comeback trail, especially if you're trying to get your team back on the right track. I want you to consider these five ideas, these five keys to effective uh, team leadership. The first thing is this, is that the captain maintains the team's focus on the vision. Now, as, as leaders, we've got to keep the people focused on the vision and the overall win. I, I, think, I think the first thing we should do is when we're meeting with our teams, define the win, set a goal. What are we trying to accomplish in these next three months? What are we trying to accomplish in these next six months? What are these, what are we trying to accomplish this year? We always start out with a yearly vision. We, we usually put it as a theme for, for our church. It's this year, it's the year to build the year to build. And we're believing that as we set our focus on building, we're going to see great results, but then we break down that strategy to a six month strategy and to a three month strategy. It's very important to define the win because he doesn't know his target. He's not going to hit anything. So it's so important that we begin to set our target, set our mark, go after that mark, be consistently focused on what we're trying to do. You know, even as the team captain, I know the why, but I don't always know the what you see, because I've learned that he who knows the what will always need the person who knows the why. See, it's important for me to keep everybody focused on the why. Why are we doing this? Why are we strategizing this way? Why are we working long hours? Why are we working short hours? Why are we taking time to do some of the necessary things to get the job done? Now, how do you know uh, someone has lost focus? Well, let me give you a, a few keys here that I think will help you as you examine your team. Uh, you can tell someone's lost focus when personal problems cloud their vision. These can be uh, real problems in a person's life. You know, we, we know that every single one of us are going to deal with problems in our life. We're going to have personal issues that we have to overcome. But you want to be careful in monitoring the level of personal problems in your team. You know, we have to maintain a, a, a spirit of professionalism. We want teams that are going to be able to not live underneath their circumstances, but to live above their circumstances. So I think it's very important to examine the level of personal problems in your team, in your team's lives. Uh, sometimes it could even be emotional problems and people need a lot of encouragement. They need a lot of time with you. Uh, those are valuable things when, when you when you have teams that are going through issues and those personal problems begin to cloud the vision. They could take them away from the why, take them away from the overall goal. Now, what are some other ways to know someone's lost focus? Well, another way is when people get overly involved in the vision, overly involved. And basically, that's a simple way of saying they're doing too much. You know, we, we have some, you've heard it said, a, a jack of all trades, a master of none. And what we want is we want people that are specialists. We want people that are intentional. We want people that know their gifting, know their talent, and know their ability. In, in, our, in, our, in our team, if people can't do something, it's okay to say it. Hey, I, I, I'm not skilled in that area. I don't know how to do that. I think the reason a lot of times our organizations don't grow, our churches don't grow, is because we try to get people to do things they're not good at. And one thing I've learned in leadership is we want to take 70% of our energy and put it all into what we're good at. A lot of times we take 70% of our energy and try to put it into things we're not good at. I believe that when we begin to focus our vision and get people in the right place, in the right position, uh, and, the, and, and the right gifting, that's when the organization begins to grow. And sometimes it's not about what we say yes to, it's what we say no to. It's important to have a holy no in your vocabulary. You know, I'm always weary of people that are saying yes to everything. 
Yes, I could do this. Yes, I could do that. Yes, I could do. And, and that's dangerous because then if you're saying yes to do everything, you can't be great at something. You know, it's impossible to be excellent in every area without focus. I've discovered that when we're focused on the vision, focused on our gift and focus on what we are good at, the organization begins to grow. How else can you know someone's lost focus? Well, some people have a tendency to get wrapped up in the current trends. And there's always trends coming through the church, trends coming through the ministry, trends coming through the organization. Sometimes as leaders, we want to go after the latest and the greatest. We call it the shiny things. You know, we're attracted to the shiny things. I think sometimes there could even be a little bit of ego involved in that. We want to be in the spotlight. We want to be, we want people to see us and we want our gifts to shine. But in order to be, build an effective organization, you, you need to have people that are not swayed by the trends, that they know what God is doing in that organization. They know what God is doing in that church. They know what God is doing in that business. They know what they're supposed to be doing and they're willing to place their focus on it. And I'm always leery of people that are easily enticed into other areas that seem to be trends. And and, and, and I've learned that if you're going to have a lasting organization, you really need leaders that know how to stay focused. So as captains, we have to keep our teams focused on the vision. And if a team loses sight of their existence in the, in, in the organization, then not only have they failed themselves, but they failed the team. And we want to keep people focused because if they lose sight of why they're there, it could have catastrophic damage to what you're trying to build. So as a captain, let's keep teams focused on the vision. What is the why? What are we trying to accomplish this year? What are we trying to accomplish in the next six months? What are we trying to accomplish in the next three months? Set those goals. And let me add, when the goal is reached, celebrate it. Have a big party. Make sure people feel like they've reached the goal. I think it's cruel and unusual punishment to never tell people how they're doing. And I have a habit of constantly telling people they're doing a great job. And I'm not being disingenuous. If they're not doing a great job, I won't say anything. I won't reward them. But if they are doing a great job, I will not uh, be shy in letting them know. I will make sure they know very clearly that they're on the right track. The, the second key to being an effective team leader or a captain is that the captain should nurture positive and productive relationships in the team. I believe that we're called to move in harmony if we're going to reach our goals. Now, this is difficult because when you have strong teams, you have strong personalities. And the aggressive style, the, the strong will, the independent nature of most leaders can result in tenuous relationships. There's a, there's a certain level of tension when you have a really great team. Now, if your team is growing, you know, there's going to be a harmony around, hey, we're all growing. There's going to be a harmony around, hey, we believe in the vision. We believe in the dream. Great things are going to happen. But what I have discovered in working with teams over time, now I've had people on my team that have been with me for 20 years. I've had people on my team that have been with me for 12 years. I think even some of my youngest team members have been with me a minimum of five years. And what I have discovered is that the more leader becomes uh, aware of their gift, aware of their talent, and aware of what they bring to the table, it brings a stress on the relationships. Teams age. They go through phases. You have those early phases of we're excited about the vision. Then you move into a phase where, hey, we're getting results and we need to move quicker. And then you get into another phase where even teams become weary and relationships could become tenuous. And as a captain of teams, we have to be able to nurture those relationships that they have with themselves. There, there are a few guidelines that I think are, are, are important in nurturing team relationships. The first thing is, is we need to respect each other. It's important for, for teams to have that respect. Now, that's a high standard for me um, as, a, as a captain, as a minister of the gospel, as a leader, where there's no respect, there can be no relationship. So anybody that I work with, whether it's inside the ministry, whether it's friends outside the ministry, whether it's a business leader, whether it's a community leader, uh, it could even be the mayor of the city. There has to be respect. There has to be a respect 
for my leadership and who I am. There has to be a respect for what I do because the ministry is my life's work and I can't afford to build relationships with people that don't understand what I'm doing and don't respect what I'm doing. So respect is very, very important. If we can lead with respect for one another, we can have more harmony. Um, You want people to understand that we're involved in doing the work of God, but we also care about each other. I've learned that it's hard to care about the lost when we can't even care about the people we have. So when teams love each other, they respect each other, they have that mutual respect, that's when things go well. Another guideline uh, for nurturing our teams is professionalism. It's so important to be professional in everything we do. Now, not, not every organization is perfect. You know, um, we do our best, especially when you're working with volunteers. Uh, I think when you're working with a paid team, a paid staff, uh, you can kind of lean on them a little bit more in, in certain areas. But when you're working with volunteers, uh, it's just because they're not paid doesn't mean they can't be professional. It's so important that we're going to have effective teams that not only we have respect, but we have professionalism. Uh, what's one example of professionalism? Answering the phone. <laughs> Answering the phone. I remember uh, my pastor when he took over the church that I'm leading now. Uh, our church was small. We had about 75 people in the church. Uh, and I remember he, he had a real heavy uh, value of everybody had to be in the office. Now, he was traveling the world, and we were holding down the fort and working as a team, and everybody had to be in the office. And I remember he would call the office at 9 o'clock in the morning, call the reception desk, and make sure there was a receptionist there, and there always was. And then he would start asking, hey, where is Al? Where is Miller? Where is Georgina? Where is, you know, where, where, where's the staff? And you know what? The receptionist would snitch on us. <laughs> if we were late, she would say, hey, they're not here yet. And sure enough, it would just be a moment or two before our own phone would be ringing and say, hey, where are you? Why are you not in the office? Because we we're trying to establish a level of professionalism that even though we were volunteers, we were setting a standard of professionalism. You know, professionalism is not only answering your phone, but answering text message. Everything is text message now. And I think even with text message, you got to be careful because text has no tone. I have a staff member, uh, one of our ministers, Victor Seely, that he always says, text has no tone. And a lot of times text can seem cold. They can seem harsh. You know, you're not trying to be harsh to a text, but you're just asking a question or you're just bringing something out. But the way we hear it a lot of times has to be is determined by the mood of the hearer. So when they're hearing that text message, it, it could sound abrupt, you know, as a man thinketh in his heart. So is he the Bible says. So a lot of times, you know, we use the voice uh, note and we send a voice note because we want people to hear like, hey, look at man, this is just something I wanted to ask you about. Uh, We want to take off the edge of intensity on this text message because we want to maintain professionalism and respect. Uh, Another way to nurture um, our our relationships in our teams is obviously uh, is to spend time with our team, spend time together. I mean, this is ideal. Now, when you're small, it's easy. When you don't have that many people in the church and you don't have that much going on, it's easy to spend time. It's easy. It's easy to go to dinner. It's easy to take everybody out. It's even easy to pay for everybody sometimes. But as the organization grows, as the ministry grows, as the teams begin to grow, I mean, when you think about our church, we have 250 leaders in our church. All, I mean, pretty much almost all of them are volunteers, about 80% of them them are volunteers. And that's a lot of people to lead. And so when you're leading that many people in a church, you know, you have to be strategic in who you spend time with, how you spend time with them. And we want to be able to come back and get our organizations back on track. And I I do believe it it begins in that quality time. Um, I'm I'm spending more time right now with our uh, ministers, their wives, our top leadership, our staff. Um, I'm really being intentional about who I spend time with because I realize that if I can spend time with the influencers, then the influencers will in turn spend time with the people they're influencing. And what's our goal in relationships? Our goal is to create a sound and to create a language as a church that is not just in the first three rows of the church. We, we want the back row of the church to be just as engaged as the front row. We want the back row of the church to be worshiping just as strongly as the front row. 
We want the back row to understand the language, the culture, and everything that we're doing in the boardroom. And a lot of that takes place through relationships. So relationships are so important. You got to be intentional about spending time with your team. You've got to be intentional about uh, really uh, uh, be being strategic with who you spend time with so that you can create a culture. And, and let me give you another, another two more values. I think this is helping somebody, especially if you're trying to get back on track with your team. We're talking about being a captain, a leader, um, support one another and serve one another. This is so important. Um, I, I think when you care about the whole organization, you care about the outcome, you care about the why, you care about the overall win, you're not going to just be so excited about what you're doing. You're going to be excited about what other people doing, are doing. What I love about our church, our ministry here in San Diego, is that there's a spirit of encouragement. There's a, there's a spirit of, of celebration. Uh, our staff knows how to pat each other on the back, how to congratulate one another. You know, you might not be doing so great in your area, but you see someone doing great in the area and you go ahead and you get behind them and you and you support them and you have good words for them. And, and then when it's your season, they have the same for you. I tell people all the time, I said, you, w w when you're sitting in the church and someone's preaching and, you know, you're just sitting on your phone, looking at your phone. I know sometimes we take notes and we do that. Um, but if you're just like not tuned in, you're not shouting them down, you're not amening them, you know, what you, what you, what you sow is what you're going to reap. You know, the, you never want to feel alone in leadership. And so our team has a way of getting behind each other, especially when they're preaching or ministering in music, they, they know how to get up and be the biggest fan, so to speak. And it, it really is genuine because they know that when they get up there, they want to get that equal support. I, I preach in so many services where you're just there and you're preaching and people are just staring at you. And there's no, there's not a lonelier place to be than a place like that. So in our church, we really stir our staff up to support one another in whatever they're doing, whether they're leading an event, whether they're leading a weekend, whether they're putting on an outreach, you know, our staff has a tendency to go to everything. So if you have an outreach taking place and you have three staff members leading it, the whole team will be there just to support it. Even if they don't have any responsibility they'll show up. Even if it's, you know, a little bit late, they'll show up and say, Hey, I just want to let you know I'm here. I'm behind what you're doing. That's what nurtures healthy teams. And let me give you the, the final thing, which I feel is so important to leading an effective team is to eliminate competition. We're, we're one team with one sound. And there's only two people we're competing against. Number one, we're competing against the world and against the enemy. Because we know there's a real enemy and we know that to defeat that enemy, we've got to work together. We've got to work together in mind, work together in heart, work together in spirit. You know, we, we say no one works alone, no one worships alone, and nobody warfares alone. So as a team, we eliminate competition. We're not trying to outdo each other. We don't compete with each other. We complete each other. That's our vision. That's our heartbeat. In, in having an effective team. And then also to really uh, create one sound as a team. We want, we want to be so united, so connected, that if you talk to our children's leader, they're speaking the same language as the pastor. If you're talking to our recovery home director, he's speaking the same language as the children's leader. If you're speaking to the worship leader, he speaks the same language as the life group leader. We're one team with one heart, with one sound. Now, the, 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 the final thing that I really want to bring out today, and, and I think this is really helping a lot of people, is that as the captain, we have to identify ideas for individual growth. So we're getting back on track. We're, we're, we're riding the ship. We're, we're on the comeback trail as an organization, or as a church. But we really have to look for individual growth in our team members. Now, we as captains hold the key to that. It's important to provide opportunity for each team member to become a better leader, a better disciple, and to capitalize on better opportunities. You know, remember that team members, they also want to be productive. And I could tell you as, that being a captain of teams in, in different fields and in different ministry realms, there's nothing worse than looking at a leader that's frustrated, looking at a leader that you know, you're having a meeting, you're having a board meeting, you're having a, a, an eldership meeting, you're having a ministry meeting, you're, whatever meeting, and you see someone there that is frustrated, 
They don't talk. There's no energy coming out of them. And it, as the captain, for me, it really is rough because you can have maybe eight or 10 people in that meeting or six people that are excited. And then you see this one leader that's kind of looking down at their notes. There's no ideas flowing out of them. The meeting's over, they close their book and they're out. And there's no talk after the meeting. And, and there's even churches like that where you get up there and preach and everybody's so frustrated that everybody just wants to go home. That's a sign of having a bad leadership culture. And so um, what, what I feel is so important is we have to begin to look at the people around the table and ask ourselves, is this person in the right place? Are they happy? Do they feel like they're contributing? I'll do that. I'll, I'll go around and I'll ask people, hey, man, how do you feel? Do you feel like you're making an impact? Do you feel you're in the right place? Do you feel like you're contributing at this time? And a lot of times they'll say yes, but sometimes they'll say, you know what, I'm a little frustrated. Um, they might text me and say, hey, it was a good meeting, but... And so these are the areas where as captains, we have to pay attention to these things because, you know, joy is contagious, but, but also frustration can be contagious. And so we want to be careful that we're seeing where people are at and we're identifying places where they can grow, where they can contribute, and where they can be the best version of who they are as a leader. Now, there's, here's a few questions to ask yourself as a captain, and I think this will help you first. Are people coming up the ranks or are people being bottle, bottlenecked? Have they hit a lid? Have they hit a lid in their leadership? Um, we want to be mindful that no matter what we're doing, there's always a new group that God is raising up. And a lot of times I'll just kind of walk through the church and, and kind of, you know, spend time in open spaces trying to identify who are the ones that are developing influence in our setting. Uh, who are the ones that are working hard behind the scenes? Who are the ones working with joy? Who are the ones that are carrying our spirit, that want to contribute, that want to make an impact? So it's important to know who those people are. Also, ask ourselves this question, is there an opportunity for them to take a more important task, to take on a more important role? You know, when I started out in ministry, I started out in media. I mean, my first ministry was sound. I didn't even run the board. I just wrapped cables, set up microphones. Then I went to television. I would run camera and run the cables and I would grip for other camera people. And then from there, I opened up a life group and grew that life group. Then from there, I went to open up student ministry. Then from there, I went to pastoring a church. You know, the Bible says, be faithful in the little and you will be put over much. But none of that would have happened unless someone identified me and saw my faithfulness, saw my fruit and opened up a greater opportunity for a more important task. See, it's so important as captains that we're nurturing the destiny of our followers. That's very important. They're not just there to serve, but they want to move in a spirit of destiny. So as leaders, we want to watch them. We want to see how they're progressing. We want to see how they're producing, and we want to nurture their destiny. That's how to have a healthy organization. You know, we don't hire a lot of people in our church because, you know, that also produces something different. But we look for volunteers that people that are not leading with their mind, but they're leading with their heart and they're leading with their life. And we've seen great results. Let me let me give you one other question to ask yourself as a captain. Um, is it too complex to rise up? Is it too hard? Is there too much bureaucracy? Is there too much is there is there too much politics in the church? You know, sometimes in the ministry, it's not what you know, it's who you know. And that can be difficult for some people. Sometimes we structure our, our organizations in such a complex way that people kind of quit before they even get started. You know, one thing I've learned in, in growing a healthy ministry and building an effective ministry is that when people come into the church, they immediately want to make an impact. It doesn't matter what their maturity level is. They're coming for a reason. And when they come in through the door, they might start sitting out in the back row or moving towards the middle, or they might know somebody, but they're tuned into what's happening on the platform. And I could tell you, I've had many people come to the church and say, you know, pastor, when I started coming, it was really because I watched you, because I saw what you were preaching. I heard what you were preaching. It impacted my life. It just cut through all the noise. And I began to feel like there was something for me in this church. And somehow that I needed to be connected to you. But sometimes we structure around ourselves in such a complex way that people can't get close. And I think we need to ask ourselves this question. 
is it too hard for people to come up? These, these are questions that we can ask ourselves in building in this new season. I, I, I'm telling my team right now, let's make it as simple as possible. You know, there might have been a time where people would come to church and they had to be in the church four months before they could do anything or three months before they could serve. You know, now <laughs> we're at a place where like, if you come to church and you're here for two weeks, we're already looking to get you serving because we believe that people are looking for an opportunity to rise up and to fulfill their potential in the house of God. And, and, and that's what's on my heart today. I, I hope you receive something. Um, I'm, I'm praying for you. I'm rooting for you. I'm rooting for your church. I'm rooting for your organization. I'm rooting for your business. I feel like we haven't yet seen the greatness that's going to come out of you. So if you're a team leader, you're a captain, just know we're with you. We're behind you. Uh, stay tuned into the podcast. We're, we're tuning into what you're doing too. So make sure that you write down some of the great results you're seeing in your team. Write down how some of this information is being useful to you. I hope you're being transformed. I hope it's more than information because that's not what this is about. We want transformation in our lives, in our leadership, and in our churches, and in our organization, and even in our families. So listen, thank you for tuning in today, man. I see greatness in you. Keep going forward. Don't give up. The best is yet to come. Thanks for tuning in to Catch Fire Podcast. Be sure to subscribe and leave a comment. We love you, and we'll talk to you soon.